know that lady. <laughs> You better be watching. Yeah, I'm sure you have every one of them. Oh, my God. A meeting of the Hudson Historical Society is now called to order. On behalf of the Society, we want to help welcome everyone to the meeting and program. If we have any visitors here, we want to invite you to join the Society. Uh, Get our newsletter, participate in our activities. We have some applications on the back table back here. Um, we accept donations. We have some books for sale. And in the archives upstairs, we have more books, shirts, and other things. Does anyone have any special announcements they need to make at this time? you have an announcement? Oh, I thought you were We want to uh, remind everybody that our programs are on YouTube, DVDs. We have DVDs of past programs. Is there anything else that needs to be brought up before the meeting? Before the program? Okay, I'm going to turn the program now over to Mickey Thrasher, and he will introduce our guests and uh, the state. I don't think I need that. This is going to be a great program tonight. Um, I also wanted that Doc Gary asked me to be so kind as to do the introductions for him tonight. Well, radio's my passion. Music's my passion. I love it. And when he asked me, I, I, I couldn't say no to it because I want to hear these stories. Backstory. There's nothing better than a good backstory. A little bit about Gary. Gary was born in Thomasville, <coughs> Georgia, on our stroke. He left the community, family moved to Atlanta at the age of 13. But he was 15 years old. 15 now, mind you. The number one radio station in Atlanta was WQXI, Quixie Radio. This man at the age of 15 is on the air at Quixie Radio. Go forward just a few years, the Beatles come to Atlanta, August the 18th, 1965, he's on the stage with them. I don't know if he brought him out, but he was up there with guys. He's got some memorabilia from here from them. Matter of fact, I mean, I don't remember, but you know, the Beatles actually played in the stadium before the Braves ever did. Braves didn't follow him here. But anyway, Gary's been all over the country. He's, um, he's worked with uh, the Eagles. He's done documentaries associated with Dr. Martin Luther King, Charlie Daniels. He was instrumental in uh, that album, Going Gold, that was produced out in Macon, Georgia. And I could just go on and on. But instead of me doing it, I can't wait to hear him talk. Let me just give him to you. Gary Doc Granger. Stand backstage and you listen to an introduction and you say to yourself, who the heck's he talking about? Somebody did all those things? <laughs> Mickey Thrasher is one of the great musicologists in our business. He is still in the business. <coughs> He's also a great interviewer. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to sit with Mickey and we're going to talk about marketing that catalog he has of some of the great interviews uh, I've heard. So thank you very much, Mickey, and thank you uh, for being here tonight. I recognize faces from 63 years ago. I actually do, and I have some great memories. We're going to talk a little bit about. My mother said to me, when you're doing special events, always dress up. Because you can always dress down after you get there. If it's an outside event, and you're chasing a girl through the woods, which I know you're going to do a lot of, Always wear clean underwear. Remember that? 
And if this event happens to be down by a river or a lake, and she's chasing you, and she catches you, and she has this great imagination, and she wants to go skinny dipping, wear clean underwear. Make me proud. So, we'll start by dressing down, leaving the underwear on, I want to thank uh, Kay and, uh, and Kayla and uh, Jameson and the staff here. They've really been great in uh, bringing this together. I worked a long time to eliminate my southern accent because I was told when I first started in broadcasting a couple of things. Number one, do not smoke cigarettes because it'll destroy your voice. And you have such a beautiful voice. And number two, uh, you've got to get rid of that southern accent, which I worked hard to do. And I was able, with some help, to pretty much get rid of it. But I wanted to keep the southern culture. So I kept a few things in my mind that I took with me. I remember going into San Francisco and uh, they would say, so when are you coming over? And I'd say, I'll be over directly. <clears throat> what is that? Well, as soon as I finish cutting the grass. So you're saying to me, you'll be over directly as soon as you finish cutting the grass. They thought cutting the grass was some sort of special blend of marijuana from South Florida. <laughs> And then I would say, I swanee. And they would say, what? I swanee. Well, what does that mean? Do you remember I swanee? Well, I swanee is a euphemism for uh, religious profanity, which we never had in our world. We never use, mention the Lord's name in vain. So, be there directly as soon as I finish cutting the grass. And I swung. I kept my southern culture and was very proud. And I'm proud that my mother and daddy planted my life seed here in this town. And I'm very happy after these circles and meandering around the country and the world back here in front of you tonight very much. Joe Field, who is now the chairman of the board of the second largest broadcast company in America, they just bought CBS a couple of years ago, um, highly successful, great violinist, still goes away in the summertime with his associates and they play the violin. Very creative. Very creative man. I said to Joe once, so to what do you owe your enormous success? And he said, I owe my success to surrounding myself with good people. And I owe my success to listening to my mother and daddy when they guided me toward law school. Because if I had not studied law at Yale, graduated in the class with Pat Robertson. If I had not studied law, I would not have been able to afford the legal fees required to maneuver myself through the maze of regulations of business in America. So on a, on a much smaller scale, but perceptually akin, I was fortunate to be able to surround myself with good people. Good people in this town, the coaches, uh, the teachers. James Dawkins, I remember very, very well. Played golf once, uh, paired with a guy in Florida. 
and on a golf course, you know, you talk about things, background, so on and so forth. Thomas de Georgia. Did you ever know a little guy named Jimmy Dawkins? And I said, well, he wasn't a little guy to me. He was a big guy to me. Well, Jimmy and I played football together, and Jimmy was a great little scat back. It was Coach Wilson. There was the uh, the great uh, schools, community center, at water, which we'll talk a little bit about. So I always surrounded myself with good people, and hopefully have always been one of those good people that others wanted to be uh, surrounded by. So the theme is imagine, and the question is imagine what? What do you imagine? You imagine good health, you imagine good times, you imagine your grandchildren making it through life, unhurt with uh, carrying forth the culture that you're proud of and that you are passing on to them. My entire career was surrounded by imagination. And imagination to me is, is one of the great gifts from God. Without imagination, life is pretty boring. With imagination, opportunities abound. Ingles, always striking up a conversation. People look at my my hat, the way I'm dressed, the way I talk. I don't think you're from here. Uh, well, yeah, I am from here. Really? Yeah, I just came in. What's your name? Well, my name is Gary. Never knew a Gary. I used to know Michael, Michael Granger. You know anything about Michael Granger? So I learned pretty fast. Next time in line, they say, so, who are you? Well, my name is Michael Granger. No, no, Michael Granger. But I used to know a guy named Gary Granger. He was a DJ in Atlanta. You know anything about him? First day of school in Atwater, we were, I was part of that post-World War II baby boom. They built this extra building on the property to houses. And I come home from school and say to mother, there's another Granger in this class. Really? Who, who is, what's the name? Well, his name is Michael. They called his name all day. <laughs> Nobody ever raised his hand. And you know something, mother? They never call my name. Her eyes got a little moist. Wonderful smile came over her face. Son, you are Michael Gary. Who knew? You learn. You learn something every day. In radio, we always play trivia. We always like to give things away. Big things, little things, whatever. If I didn't at least offer a little trivia game tonight, I wouldn't be living up to my reputation of being a big time disc jockey. Who's, who is this person in my arms? If you know, you're shouting out. Who is in these arms of mine? Any idea? Maybe? Dumb, dumb, born at the charity ward of Grady Hospital, five foot four, used to stand on a wooden crate because she was so tiny and sing on Atlanta television. Sweet nothings. 
Who said Brenda Lee? There we go. Little Brenda Lee. We're building a new restaurant in this town. It's Australian flavor. And I am giving you a $5 Australian bill with a queen on it. Okay. That could be a collector's item. You can spend it or you can take it to the bank because it's real money. Isn't that a beautiful bill? Brenda Lee. I asked to see her in the afternoon. This nightclub in Fort Lauderdale was called a Bachelor's Three, which was owned by Joe Namath and two of his buddies. And he brought in uh, Top Name Entertainment. And uh, I asked to see her because I wanted to tell her the story of sitting in front of the television, probably Channel 2, WSB, and watching her stand on that crate. So that night at the show, Suddenly she comes off stage and falls in my arms and sings sweet nothings to me. Brenda Lee. Now this guy is a guy that was always welcome in my arms. That's right, that's Charlie Daniels. Let me tell you a little bit about Charlie Daniels. A dear, dear friend of mine going back to 1972. You've heard of catastrophic thinking, where you know some people, or times even maybe for yourself, where you're thinking, it's not only gonna rain, but it's gonna be thunder and lightning, and the lightning's gonna kill my cat. Or, I'm going to the doctor and I know, I'm just, I know I'm dying of something, Catastrophic thinking. The antithesis of catastrophic thinking is Charlie Daniels. He only saw blue skies. The most positive human being I ever knew in my life. A pleasure to be around. And also, he had a photographic memory. I would have a conversation with Charlie Daniels. Two years would pass, and he would pick up the conversation where it lasts stopped. Just an unbelievable man. When I needed help for a charity event or some special activity, I would call Charlie and he would say, Doc, you know the routine. You book two, two seats, one for me and one for my fiddle, and tell my people where I'm supposed to be and he was always there. He was at an event in Fort Lauderdale, a, uh, some sort of children's hospital. Obviously did not get much attention from the outside. I arranged for the mayor of Fort Lauderdale to present Charlie with the key to the city. And we walk in, a young girl, probably about 13 years old, who had not seen anyone from the outside for a while. She runs all the way across the room, jumps up, wraps her arms around Charlie, wraps her legs around Charlie, and pees on him. <laughs> Charlie did not skip a beat. We went straight to the stage. He took the girl with him. People from the newspaper taking pictures the urine in Charlie's pants. He hugged her, loved her. Charlie Daniels. So I called Charlie and I said, I'm, I'm hired to take this dumpy old radio station outside Richmond, Virginia, and make, try to make something out of it, which I enjoy doing, the imagination part. What do you need, Gary? Doc? Well, you're playing Old Dominion on a Saturday. Is there any way we could hold you over? We'll build a stage in front of the building and you perform. Look, I gotta be in Charlotte Sunday night. If you can get me down to Charlotte Sunday night, yeah, I'll do it for you. I said, I will, we'll rent a plane. 
Do you mind a small plane? He said, no, I fly little planes all the time. A little 150, it'll be okay. Put a sign, a huge banner, across the front of the building that said, Charlie Daniels, here, live, on a particular date. Nobody believed it. Why would Charlie Daniels appear here at this little dumpy radio station? So when the show opened, nobody was there. But then the word started spreading around that he is actually there. He performed for three hours. As I discussed with Luke Haney one night when I showed him this picture, this picture was taken probably about the time Charlie started playing because when he finished his three hours, that was just a wave of people. That was Charlie Daniels. I'm honored to have been awarded 25, 30 gold records in my career. My first gold record was from Charlie Daniels in 1972. And this uh, little restaurant we're building, if we have time to talk about it later, there will be one gold record in the pub of that restaurant. And it'll be this one from Charlie Daniels. You don't forget good friends. I was scheduled to be with Charlie at the Grand Ole Opry uh, the April before he passed away. <coughs> we were talking about uh, opening a restaurant called CDB, Charlie Daniels Biscuits. And the target was, as you go into Walmart, there was a little subway type, you know, little things you see off to the side. So there also will be, along with the gold record at this restaurant, there will be a menu item called CDB, a Charlie Daniels biscuit, because I know Charlie would appreciate that. The last time I saw Charlie, we just come back from, uh, from Australia, and I got a, uh, an Akuba, Akuba hat for Charlie, uh, presented it to him in Ocala, Florida. He was uh, very pleased with it, and he wore it on stage that night. Always remember Charlie Daniels. Imagination. Doc and mother. My daddy always liked to get in the pickup truck Saturday, Sunday, and we always went to the same places. I don't know why he wanted to go back to Barnesville. I don't know why he wanted to go to Molina. I don't know why he wanted to go to Yatesville or Griffin or wherever. He just, he just loved the landscape, the beautiful rolling hills we see around Thomaston. So he pulled the truck off to the side. He had a keen eye for ripe peaches. Pulls over, stops the truck, asks me to get out. We walk over to the fence, picks me up, puts me on the other side of the fence, and boy, I go over and pick that peach right there. The one, the one, that one, that one right there. Okay, Daddy. So I go over and pick the peach. By the time I get back, he's already got his his knife, you know, out of his out of his pocket, peeling that peach. Gives me a little bit goes down the road, you know, eating that peach. We get home and I tell Mother the story. Next thing I know, Mother and Doc are in the truck, headed back to that peach orchard. She found the little road that led up to the man's house, gave me a nickel, and said, I want you to go out and knock on the man's door and pay him for that peach. Okay. So when I get out to the house, the man with his wife are sitting on the front porch. What can I do for you, boy? And I handed him a nickel. What's this for? And I told him the story. So your daddy told you to steal an apple, a peach, from my orchard. Yes, sir. Did he give you some? Yes, sir. 
He did. And your mother brought you back here to pay me. Yes, sir. Stay right here, boy. Disappears, goes around back, and comes back with those little cartons. You know, they were like, uh, I don't know what they were made of, like a thin, some sort of thin wood or something. And he had this carton of peaches for me. And he gave them to me. I said, sir, I don't have any more money. You've paid me. You've paid me. You gave me a great day. You take these peaches back home, and you have your daddy make you some peach ice cream. I said to my mother, so what will I be when I grow up? And she said, well, I'll tell you what you will not be. You will not be a politician. What's a politician, mother? You'll learn, which I did. First time I met Bill Clinton, I'm traveling with my, my brother. We're staying at the uh, Ritz-Carlton in Buckhead. And uh, I go downstairs because I knew that Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead was going to be there. And I go down, hook up with Jerry, and Jerry said, there's a car about to arrive here. I want you to meet the next president of the United States. And I said, who is that? He said, his name is Bill Clinton. I should have never heard of him. He said, you will. So I called back to the room and said to my brother, I want you to come downstairs. There are a couple of people I want you to meet. My brother came down. I introduced them. My brother wasn't as keen on music or things as I was at that time. <clears throat> and he says to me, so who are those guys? And I said, well, one of them is Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead. And the other guy is Bill Clinton. And he said, who is that? <clears throat> I said, I don't trust the guy with that crooked finger. I understand. My mother said, you will be an explorer. And I said, what's an explorer, mother? She goes to the other room and comes back with an Encyclopedia Britannica. And she handed it to me and said, open the book, open the pages, and you'll learn what an explorer is. Years later, a man who became a, quite a, a mentor and partner of mine, um, who probably at that time was only maybe 50 years old, I thought he was really an old, old man. I thought his career was ending as my new career and fresh ideas was beginning. So I said to him once, so what goals do you remain in your life? What does he want to accomplish? And he said, my remaining goal in life is to contribute in some small way to the amelioration of mankind. Amelioration? I'm thinking back to my mother saying, you're going to be an explorer. And I said, what is amelioration? And he said, that typewriter I gave you, along with that dictionary, that I told you was going to be a good guide for you along the way, I want you to go back to that dictionary, and I want you to look up the word amelioration. How do you spell it? You'll figure it out. In the day. With imagination. With imagination comes a whole different world. Can you imagine that this guy could be mistaken for Alice Cooper? In a dark room, maybe? Could you imagine that this guy, who is the same as this guy, who is the same as this guy, who is the same as this guy and this guy, could he be mistaken for Elton John? Well, we're on a flight from New York to <coughs> Atlanta on Delta. First class, we always flew first class. Drinking champagne out of a plastic flute. 
stewardess, we referred to them in those days, tend to take a liking to these two guys. Finally stopped and leaned over at my good buddy, the judge, who was a scratch golfer and blind as a bat, and said, you look like somebody important. Who are you? Well, my friends call me Alice. Really? And who is this guy with you? Well, they call him Mr. John. And when I tell you that all heck broke loose, it did. My God. Alice Cooper and Elton John on this flight. Disappears. Suddenly she takes away our plastic flutes and we're drinking out of crystal champagne glasses. She comes back and says to Alice, the captain would like to see you in the cockpit. And I'm saying to my buddy, Alice, I don't like this. I don't like where this is going. And he said, just, just play along with it. And he also said, oh, by the way, those stupid glasses, we wouldn't get as, in as much trouble. So he goes up to the cockpit, it's gone for 15, 20 minutes, comes back, very proud that he signed the flight log, and I'm thinking, well, now this thing is over, we can put it behind us. Captain comes on the PA and <coughs> announces to the passengers, we're very honored to have you know, on this flight tonight, Alice Cooper and Elton John. <laughs> and I just spent a little time with Alice, and I contacted Atlanta, and Delta has agreed with Alice and Mr. John picking up their part of the tab. Free champagne for everybody. The stewardess will bring glasses for those who need them. So I'm wandering with Alice in the aisle, back in coach, and I'm hearing on this side, that ain't them. <laughs> and I'm hearing on this side, oh no, it is them. I've seen them in concert many, many times. That is Elton John and Alice Cooper. Played golf with uh, the judge Alice and Alice once in Florida and when we finish the 18th we're coming off the green and people are coming to this Alice to get autographs. For many many years there was a picture of Alice and Alice and Doc in the clubhouse <coughs> of, that, uh, of that golf course. So I'm saying to the judge Alice Think ahead. The captain has announced that Alice Cooper and Elton John are on this flight. When we get to Atlanta, we should be prepared that media might be there. So, when we get to Atlanta, you do your magic and you keep people busy, occupied. I'll go to Hertz and I'll upgrade the Ford to the biggest thing they've got, because we can't leave the Atlanta airport in a Ford. So, I do. I upgraded to whatever it was, a Lincoln or Cadillac, and as I'm coming back to join the judge, this uh, middle-aged guy, uh, business guy, is walking toward me. He has a cast on his arm. Mr. John, my daughter would never forget me if I went home without an autograph. Okay? So, in the Atlanta airport, I'm signing this man's cast. Best wishes. I couldn't go all the way. I just did E. I will bet you, out there on eBay, there has been sold a cast with Elton John's signature on it, 
probably over and over. So it takes the right situation, the right lighting, the, the right attitude, and a great deal of imagination. Well, let me just tell you one thing about it. This was a, uh, my first book back in 2008. We were on our way to the ZZ Top New Year's Eve show in Fort Worth. Flew into Dallas. There were 40 limos. Each group had their own limo. And we stopped halfway at this Tex-Mex uh, restaurant. Uh, it was an annual event. And then on stage, they built uh, special seating uh, like a, what do you call those, uh, the seats, uh, not the best seats, you know, at a football game, the uh, whatever they call it, on the side of the stage, and that's where we saw the show. This girl just happened to be walking by as the photographer came to the table to take the picture. The judge did not want his picture taken without a pretty girl by his side. So he pulls her down, pictures taken, somewhere out there, 75, 80, 85, I have no idea how old she was. And there's a woman out there who was on the front page on the cover of an incredible book. Imagination. This is a story that I, I tell you not as one that got away, but the lesson I learned from this one is if a person takes the time to contact me, knock on my door, worked long and hard to come up with an idea and they want a little guidance or maybe they want some investors or whatever, I never say no during 24 hours in a day. And if somebody takes the time to, to call me, I'll meet with them. This guy's name is Gary Proper. Gary Proper was a world-class surfer. He represented Hobie Cat for 31 years. When I met him in Palm Beach, his career as a surfer was pretty much over because when you get into your 30s, you can't compete in that world. So he was then managing bands, groups. He was a manager for Carrot Top. Uh, he was a manager for Gallagher both comedians, and he called me and he said, got to see you, Doc, got something big. Everything Gary Proper came up with was the biggest, the biggest thing that ever happened. Yeah. So I didn't take it terribly seriously, but you're gonna like this one, Doc. So <clears throat> I meet him at the Palm Beach Yacht Club and he said, we pull, we pull off this deal. We were there on the membership of the guy that owned the company, the promotion company that he worked for. We pull off this thing and we'll both have memberships at the Paul Beach Rock Club. What you got? He had a comic book. Okay? The Ninja Turtles. $25,000 for a comic book. Gary, I don't know. Every time Gary and I talked, last time I saw him was in uh, Sacramento. By then, he had created this thing called MMA, Mixed Martial Arts, and that he was promoting worldwide. He always said, you missed out on that one, Doc. $25,000, he ended up owning a very large percentage of the Ninja Turtles, produced most of their movies, I don't know if he produced them all. So the point being, somebody calls me with a comic book idea, I'll listen, I got time. Got a lot, a lot of time. All it takes is the right imagination to bring these things together and things happen. This was imagination. You might remember WKRP in Cincinnati. What was that, 80s? Well. WKRP in Cincinnati was crafted after a real radio station called WQXI in Atlanta. There was an ad agency in Atlanta with an ad man 
who spent an awful lot of money with us and spent a lot of time at the radio station and was, was impacted by these crazy guys uh, and the ones who preceded us and the ones who followed us. WKRP in Cincinnati was not necessarily crafted after these guys, but it was crafted by about that radio station. This guy, Skinny Bobby Harper, was portrayed in WKRP in Cincinnati as uh, the afternoon guy, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fever. Johnny Fever, that one. First time I was invited to Skinny Bobby Harper's apartment when he moved to Atlanta to watch a football game. The doors open, and there's this guy with an eight millimeter camera filming sure. our every move. Okay. The next time we were there, a couple of weeks later, the doors open, and there's a a projection screen and we're seeing ourselves from the first visit there. It's very trippy. <coughs> he was a pretty trippy guy. He said to me, when the cops arrived, Gary, he weighed 110 pounds in those days. He was holding his 200 pound wife over the balcony by her wrist, threatening to drop her if the cops did not back off. That was Skinny Bobby. They're all gone, <coughs> except this guy. Barry Chase, Randy Robbins, Skinny Bobby Harper, Gary Granger, Patrick Aloysius Hughes, cigarettes and an ashtray on the turntable. These guys were imaginative. These guys challenged me. These guys scripted their shows. We had pre-show meetings. We had post-show meetings. We were like a well-oiled football team. We were the best. I wasn't the best. I was a kid. But I learned from the best. Took advantage of a world of imagination. This is my family. My mother, my big brother, my sister Josephine, and guess who the monkey is up there in the swing? I bring this up and I tell this story because it's important to me when I go back and think about the foundation <coughs> to me in this town. And part of that foundation was a concept called community. My sister was born with a congenital heart defect called hole in the heart. I think it's a hole between the top two and the upper chambers. I think is what it, what it was. Our family doctor here was Dr. Savington, whose office was on West Gordon Street, now houses cardiologists and orthopedic. Some of the greatest doctors in America are in that building. Dr. Savington arranged for my sister to have this surgery in Atlanta in 1956. My mother was uh, concerned, to say the least. It was a novel surgery. Uh, success rate was okay, but not great. Dr. Sappington said that St. Joseph's Hospital was going to perform the surgery gratis, but if there was any way money could be raised to help defray some of the costs of the doctors, it would be appreciated. It would not stop the surgery if we could not raise, or they could not raise money, but it would be appreciated. It's when I, when I learned this concept, which I think you'll, you'll recognize, and that is, if you know something in your mind, that's one. And if you tell somebody else, that's not two, that's 11. And that particularly holds true in a small town. Word spreads fast. Good word spreads fast. Bad words spread faster. So the word spread that this family needed some help for this operation that was coming up in Atlanta. 
We'd come home from school, and I'd go to the mailbox, open it, there'd be envelopes inside, and you guessed it, there was money inside those envelopes. Most of them were anonymous, some were identified from churches, or organizations, or whatever. That's when I learned about community. Now, she is going through the surgery that was scheduled to take most of the day. And after just a couple of hours, the doctor knocks on the door. He's back in the room, and she knows. Mother, mothers know everything. They sense the good and the bad. Where's my daughter? What's going on, doctor? Ms. Granger, everything is fine. I just want you to know that when we got into her chest, we realized that she cannot have this operation today. She needs to grow more. We're gonna send her back, just bring her back. She's coming, just bring her back to the room, doctor, please. We're gonna watch her over the next two or three years and there's going to come a time when Josephine will have grown enough that we will be able to perform this surgery. Fine. The doctor and the nurse leave. Mother and daddy sit down to uh, come up with the questions, there were a lot of questions that they wanted to ask the doctor. Not too long after the doctor left, 30, 45 minutes, my mother senses something, goes over, opens the door, about the same time as she heard the elevator down the hall opening. And out of the elevator comes the doctor and the nurse. And this time, they are coming down the hall at a very brisk pace. Something is terribly wrong. The doctor comes in, tears in his eyes. Please have a seat, Miss Granger. She didn't have a seat. She fainted. She fell backwards onto the bed that earlier my sister was on. Miss Granger, I am so sorry. We lost her. You lost Josephine Dodd. Don't understand that. Help. There was... She died. The flood shot all the way up to the bubble on the, on the ceiling where all these doctors and young medical students were seated to watch this novel operation. We could not stop the bleeding. And we lost Josephine. Imagine that happening to a mother and daddy in their early 30s. My brother understood it more than that little guy did. He understood that Josephine was not coming home. He would pat me on the shoulder and say, we're gonna play more, more baseball together. Everything will be fine. But imagine, Pasley Funeral Home, the day of the funeral. Look at the eyes of my dad. Deer in the headlights. Look at the despair in my mother's face. My big brother again was strong. He understood things a little bit better. I was too young to really understand anything. That was August 1956. The funeral cost $705.68. What would that be today? About 20000 Something like that. But when the insurance paid the $705.68, my daddy said that somebody came back from past the funeral home and offered him some of that money back because they knew we needed it. But my daddy said, no, that is your charge. You did a great job. You were comforting to me and my wife and my family. You earned the money and it's all yours. But I learned about community and you take that with you for the rest of your life. And then you circle back around 63 years later and you find out it's still here. 
that feeling of community in this town. And my mind and my heart is still here. Imagination. This guy, Bill Hewley, anybody remember him? You know, we have influence on people, particularly the young, that we don't even realize. Because we're so busy going through life, we don't know what impact we have. Well, Bill would come around to events, to our little, little league baseball games and, and the various things, and he always had a tape recorder. This was later, I think, with a cassette recorder. When I first saw Bill work, he carried around like a wallet sack or, you know, an Ampeg 602 or something like that. Um, but he was always recording people. Radio station, there was a program called Town Topics. Town Topics happened at noon every day. And it was like holding up a mirror to the community. Everything that happened in this town, you would hear about. And it had a lot to do with this guy named Bill Hewley. And I'll tell you this story, because I ended up in radio. And Bill Hewley never realized he had any influence over them. Because he didn't know who he was. I was just a little kid. After my sister passed away, and my mother and daddy were deciding what they were going to do, essentially how to recover from what had happened, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother on Howell Street. And she would say, you've got to be quiet because Mr. Miller is home today and he's working. What do you mean he's working? What does he do? Well, he's a writer. A writer? I'd look through the bushes and I'd see the back of this man, head at the typewriter, working. And I'd say to my grandmother, this is work. You know, my daddy gets up in the morning and walks all the way across town to the mill, and he comes home at the end of the day with cotton in his hair that my mother has to pick out of his hair before we can have supper. And this man is sitting at a typewriter, and that's work. One of the quotes from Olin Miller, which you have heard versions of your entire life, including one from Eleanor Roosevelt, was, you wouldn't worry about what people may think of you if you could know how seldom they do think of you. Olin Miller had great influence on me to pursue writing. And then I was surrounded by good people, good writers, journalists in Atlanta. Then, anybody ever watch The Price is Right? My mother and daddy decided we had to leave Thomaston. We had, my mother, you saw that picture of her, beautiful woman, about 130, 140 pounds, 60 pounds after my sister died. Many people thought my mother would not survive. So it was time to leave. Before they left, before we left, my daddy had the wisdom to have another baby. My kid brother, Mark, was the only one of us born in the hospital. He was born at uh, Upson Region. The day he was born, I, was walk I walked from our street in my Yankees, Little League Yankees baseball uniform, uh, walked over to the hospital on my way to Weaver Park for the ball game where Bill Healy was probably broadcasting. And I said to my mother, I'm going to hit two home runs today. One for you and one for baby brother. And my mother had a little radio on the bed and she listened and I had two home runs. How about that? Determination. So we go to Atlanta. Christmas has disappeared in our home. So has most celebrations. My mother's heart was not in it anymore. So Christmas Eve 1962, I'm out in Atlanta with a friend of mine named John, who was Jewish and not celebrating Christmas. He was two years older than me, had his daddy's car. We go to the varsity to have a Christmas Eve hot dog. And then for some reason, 
I say, let's go to the radio station. Why would we go to the radio station? I don't know, but I want to go to the radio station. So we go up to Matheson Drive at Peach Street. The, uh, the radio station was in a building, an old parsonage for the church on the corner. And we bang on the door, and eventually, this man comes to the door. Portly, effervescent, full of life, full of energy. Rod Roddy, what are you guys doing banging on my door on Christmas Eve? He said, well, there's a story behind it. Well, come on in. I'll tell you the story. So we go in and we sit with Rod Roddy till this show is over at midnight. And I experience the excitement of broadcasting, the phone ringing, people calling in with Christmas wishes, and Roddy with his imagination, imagining Santa with a sleigh coming across Chattanooga and on his way down to Rome and going to be in Atlanta in a few minutes. So Rod Roddy took us out for Christmas Eve hamburger. Next thing I know, the sun is coming up. We had been with Rod Roddy all night long, and he told us such great stories. He's a writer. He's an actor. He aspired to do great things in radio and television. I had the bug. You know what that means. You get bit by the radio bug. It's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be in radio. Never had a bad day in my career. I loved my profession until deregulation and corporate radio. Then I got the heck out. Ron Roddy had great influence on me. I was so determined I would take the bus from Forest Park to Buckhead with a transfer at Five Points, and then at the end of the night, I would reverse that and take the bus from Buckhead to Forest Park. Sometimes I missed the transfer. I would walk from Five Points across town, 14, 15 years old, to the state capitol where the interstate, at that point, I don't know if it still does, but that was the ramp to get on the interstate to go south. And I would put my thumb in my ear. Never told my mother those stories because if I did, I wouldn't be in radio very long. Now, had she asked me, I would have told her the truth. There's a thing called sin of omission. Sin of commission and sin of omission. Sin of omission is they don't ask, they don't tell. Because I was determined to be in radio. But I told Roddy the stories about me with a thumb in the air. And Roddy revealed to me that, you know, I'm not like everybody else. And I said, what does that mean? You from Mars? And he said, yeah, we'll say I'm from Mars. Roddy lived an alternative lifestyle. Uh, it wasn't like everybody else 60 something years ago. And he knew the dangers of a 14, 15 year old kid going through Atlanta with his thumb in the air. Roddy always wanted a 1955 Cadillac. He wanted the big taillights, the bigness of the car. When he got his Cadillac, he sold his 1950 Pontiac to me for a dollar. Actually sold it to my daddy. And my daddy said, okay, I trust you to drive this across town until you get your driver's license. Rod Roddy was a dear friend of mine forever. He was in the hospital on 911, uh, died shortly thereafter. He was in New York. He watched the buildings go down. He died of a combination of colon and breast cancer. He was a very talented man. Um, I told my mother, I said, I think we got a problem. What's the problem? Well, Rod Roddy's from Mars. And she said, what does that mean? I said, well, it's what the guys on the football team call. Stop there. You don't call anybody anything. People live different lives. They have different 
ways of living and doing things. She would say, we only see the same sky on cloudless days. So, don't ever bring a word like Mars into this house. She said, you'll end up with two brothers. You've already got a big brother, and he plays a lot of football with you, and now you've got another big brother. Learn from him. Roddy came down and attended my grandmother's funeral at Shiloh Baptist Church, became a good family friend, had no family of his own. Mother said, does Roddy have a family? No. Well, he's got one now. Be sure he comes down for dinner. I said, well, dinner for Roddy is at night, and dinner for us is in, in the daytime. We'll tell him to come for supper. Well, he won't know what supper is. Just tell him to come. My first day on the radio in Atlanta, Sunday morning, WQXI, the only thing I was allowed to do was open the microphone at the top of the hour and say, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to WQXI in Atlanta. Quixie and Dixie. My voice would go up a couple of octaves. I was so excited. They finally taught me how to use my regular voice. And that was every time you open the microphone, hold the telephone up to your ear and just talk like you're talking sweet nothings. Because you got a great voice and you'll do well. So I got a little princess telephone and I held it up to my ear. Imagination is what gets us through life. I imagined that I would see the Beatles when they came to Atlanta, but I did not imagine that I would be on stage with the Beatles. Imagine that. This little guy, Gary Granger, to be introduced on stage, as Mickey said earlier, August 18th, 1965. Look at the price of the ticket, $5.50. What an experience. Royal Peacock was one of my favorite nightclubs in Atlanta. They never questioned my age. I was emceeing a lot of shows, and I was pretty well known around Atlanta, so uh, I was in and out of all these nightclubs. The Whiskey-A-Go-Go -Go in Atlanta was called Whiskey-A-Go-Go -Go because you could not attach the name Whiskey to a drinking establishment. So they took the EY off and called it the Whiskagogo. I am seeing a lot of shows there. Uh, white people were welcome on Sunday. It was just known that Sunday was the day for white people. But I wasn't white. I was a disc junkie. I could go anytime I wanted to go. And I saw some great artists there. I went in there one day, and when my eyes adjusted to the dark, Sitting by the piano was Ray Charles. And on top of Ray Charles' piano was a huge fishbowl, kind of like what we had the water in tonight for you when you came in. And I'm thinking, of what, where did that fishbowl from? Well, I learned pretty quickly. I heard coins dropping in it. People would come by, drop dollars and five dollars and ten dollars. And when he finished his show, it was overflowing with money. And then like they were taking the offering plate back in the back to count the money, they would take that fishbowl with all that money in it, take it back in the back room and count it up. One for Ray, three for us. One for Ray, four for us. Uh, 12, 13 years later, back at that nightclub where you saw Brenda Lee, Ray Charles is appearing. I asked to meet with him, they agreed. And I went in and told Ray the story about the Royal Peacock and the day I saw him there. And I said, Ray, are you by any chance a sports fan? He said, yeah. I said, what's your favorite sport? I like baseball. Really? He said, yeah. I just love going to the baseball stadium and the, you know, the excitement and the sound of the ball hitting the bat and the smell of the peanuts and popcorn and hot dogs. And I said, Ray, if I'm out of line with this question, please forgive me, but it's an honest question. We've got this charity event coming up on Sunday. Would you consider umpiring our ballgame? 
And he said, Doc, I've heard it all. I've been asked to do a lot of things, but I've never been asked to umpire a softball game. He said, I'd love to do it. Came out, Holiday Park, Fort Lauderdale, sat there in 95 degree, degree heat. He would call balls with his right hand and strikes with his left hand. Crowd was getting into it, shouting, that up is blind. <laughs> Throw him out of here. <laughs> what a wonderful man, Ray Charles. Then there was Dr. King and Lester. I would leave a Dr. King press conference presentation, and I would drive to Harlem, Georgia, where Lester would sell his act handles. Lester Maddox was a very nice man. He was a goofy guy. Remember he rode that bicycle backwards or whatever he did? His restaurant was called the Pickwick Fried Chicken. Uh, I produced many of Dr. King's radio programs and had a lot of respect for him. Would share things with him like, I want to be in the big time. How old are you? I'm 60. Well, give it some time. And remember along the way, if, if you feel it's time to move on, uh, involuntary servitude went out with the Civil War. It's called the 13th Amendment. So he was, um, he was a motivator because he saw the devotion I had to my work, which impacted his job because he would, he would finish a show and come around to the studio side and he would want me to splice the tape, cut certain things out, so on and so forth. The last time I saw Dr. King was at the Atlanta premiere of the movie Dr. Zhivago. And uh, my girlfriend and I uh, go in, go down, have a seat, we come back to the lobby to get, I come back to the lobby to get popcorn and a Coke. And there's Dr. King standing all by himself at the popcorn machine. He was not recognized. And I went over, how are you, Dr. King? Good, Gary, how are you doing? Everything's good. And I said, I know my girlfriend would love to meet you. And he said, well, go get her. But hurry up, because the movie's about to start. So I go down, and I said, Dr. King is in the lobby, and I think if we get up there. So took her hand, we ran up to the lobby, and by the time we got back, he was surrounded by people. He had now become recognized. and I look for a way to catch his eye, and I finally catch him, and he holds his hand up to his ear, indicating, call me. And I called his office, and we arranged for the next time he was at the radio station that I could bring my girlfriend there so we could have a, a meeting with him. I was in radio school, Elkins Radio School in Atlanta, the day he was assassinated, and there was a lot of hollering and whistling and celebration and I left the room. So I wanted to work in the in a top five radio market by the time I was 21 and the opportunity came for me to go to Detroit and I left Atlanta with long hair kind of the, you know the Woodstock generation mindset peace and love and I get into Detroit these guys were ultra talented, but they were not peace and love. This was a radical group of people. They weren't disc jockeys. They wanted to take over the world. I said to my mother by phone, I've never seen so many drugs in my life that you see in this radio station. There are more drugs in this place than Carter's got pills. Come home, son. And I said, I can't bother, I've got a job to do. So, we are so successful here in 1969. By the way, this radio station is where, remember Paul is dead? Remember that thing that floated around, Paul McCartney? That, that whole thing came out of this radio station. But this station is billing $75,000 a month in 1969, which was an incredible success because nobody had FM radios. The only FM radios we had were on our parents' TV sets that also had 
a tuner, an AM and FM tuner, and nobody ever listened to the FM. But boy, when this station came along, people started buying FM radios, and it actually was a step. First, we sold FM converters, which converted your AM to FM, and then people started buying FM radios. So, the chairman of the board of the company that owned this, this radio station came to town to pass out uh, bonuses and to congratulate us on the great job of doing the sort of money we were doing. And these guys were ready. We're so glad you recognize our talent and our success and the money that we're making for you. With that in mind, we have a few things we'd like to discuss with you. Okay, what is that? Well, number one, we're FM. We're not those AM guys. We don't want anybody on the AM side ever in our studio again. Bad vibes. We have a black traffic director, traffic director in broadcasting, the person who schedules the commercials. We have a black traffic director, but she's not <coughs> we want to hire our own traffic director. You know we're all doing drugs in this building. That's why we're so creative. That's why you're making so much money. Because we're always so high. So we think that you should provide us the money to buy the room. Because if you don't, we're going to get busted. You're going to lose all this stuff that's going on. Oh, and by the way, we found a house downtown where we can all live together in a commune. We'll take this thing from $75,000 a month to $300,000 a month. I see these guys adjusting their ties and getting very nervous. Within 48 hours, that radio station was no longer rock and roll. It was an attempted coup to take over that radio station. Within 48 hours, we were Stereo Island. Stereo Island was some imaginative radio station somewhere out in the universe playing beautiful music. They were talented, but they weren't very smart. One guy in that meeting, I guess, was smart enough to keep his mouth shut. So, imagine this. I was called into this guy's office. His name was Dan Patrick. Dan Patrick was a great sportscaster. Monday Night Football and Radio, did every Notre Dame football game. Uh, voice of the Detroit Lions. His partner was a guy named William Clay Ford. William Clay Ford was the son of Edsel Ford. The only thing that William Clay Ford was ever allowed to do with Ford Motor Company is he the guy, he's the guy that took out the push-out vents that smokers used to, you know, flip their cigarette ashes out. This guy was a sportscaster uh, in Philadelphia, play-by-play -play for the Philadelphia Eagles, very talented guy. He's the guy who said to me, amelioration, look it up. He's a great mentor. He bought this radio station in Fort Lauderdale for $300,000. They immediately lost $100,000. It happens. They brought in a partner for another hundred. So suddenly, 50. 50 became 45, 45. So the 50-50 partnership suddenly became 45-45 because they gave up 10% of the other $100,000. So, as this radio station is becoming incredibly successful <clears throat> in meetings often, I would hear him say to him, you've got to get this committed to paper. You've got to get this $300,000 from Ford committed to paper. 
What do you think, Gene? I'm going to die? He died at the age of 53. The line was called in immediately. And we scrambled. But we made it. One of the most successful radio stations in the history of rock and roll in all of this country. Imagination. I got a call from Warner Brothers saying, we've got this group called KISS. So when you talk to your grandchildren, you tell them you met this guy tonight who not only blew it with the Ninja Turtles, but he was instrumental in bringing KISS to America. We've got this group called KISS and they're going nowhere. They're on a record label called Casablanca and Warner Brothers distributes Casablanca. They've had all these parties around the country and they're trying to get some traction and they're not getting any traction. So, their record guy in Fort Lauderdale, a guy named Eddie Pugh, called me and said, we need your help. We've got this group called KISS and we would like you to, to do some things, some promotions with us. What do you have in mind? Well, we'll give you a lot of albums and here's our idea. You play the sound of the KISS on the radio, and the ninth caller wins an album. Well, that's not very imaginative, is it? We don't do stuff like that. So, remember the judge who looked like Alice Cooper? He and I go to lunch at a place called Jacaranda in Fort Lauderdale, and did our normal sipping of wild turkey. And we said, they're kind of interesting. They're not a very good band, but, you know, imagination. Went to the bookstore and looked up the Guinness Book of Records and found that there were no KISS marathons. In the colleges, there was every marathon in the world stuffing people in phone booths and all of this stuff. But there was no kissing, <coughs> there had been no kissing marathon. And it was spring break. And you got all of these people on Fort Lauderdale Beach Let's do a kissing contest. Kiss was a national, nationally known name within six weeks. The winners of our Kiss Marathon, Little Vinny and Louise, they kissed for 92 hours on Fort Lauderdale Beach at a place called The Button. This guy is now an attorney. This guy is a writer in the islands. That's Doc, and this is the guy who called me and said, take the ninth caller. Until the day he died, a guy named Larry Harris, who's another creative writer and television producer. Uh, I said, Larry, I, I, I've seen some, some stories about how you guys came up with this brilliant idea to do this big promotion for spring break and put Kiss on the map. Larry, you know it's not true. And he said, well, you know how it works. You were out there on your own. Had this thing not worked, <coughs> you would have ended up with your 25 <coughs> albums to get away. But when it hit the big time, and I, Benny and Louise, we're on the Johnny Carson show, and What's My Line, and Mike Douglas, and I, you couldn't get away from. Since it became so big, corporations had to take a little piece of it, and they did. Imagination. Let me ask you this, and we're getting toward the end here. Um, in, in, in case you're antsy at all, I don't think you are. You're very patient, I appreciate it. Remember STP? What did STP, Andy Granatelli, and a mound of cocaine have in common? This is not a trivia question, but if somebody can answer that, I have another Australian $5 bill in my pocket. Andy Granatelli lived across the street from my partner, the amelioration guy. And we would do events on Fort Lauderdale Beach at the Hilton Hotel and bring in the biggest name entertainment uh, to
to perform. And we always went back to that house for a pool party and a barbecue, so on and so forth. And Andy Granatelli was quite a promoter, and he also enjoyed uh, being in the company of the stars. And the star of this particular day was a superstar. Television, biggest name, uh, records of the day. So, she finishes her performance, comes back to our place. She had already uh, let us know back through her management company that she really enjoys shooting pool. If there was any way, anywhere in the neighborhood, we could take her to shoot pool, she would appreciate it. So I said to Andy, would you like to have this person over? Oh, yeah, I'll bring her over. I got a pool table. So we go over to Andy's house, and suddenly she pours this cocaine on the pool table. That's Hollywood cocaine. That ain't cheap. She starts separating out the lines for people to snort the cocaine, and somebody says, Andy's coming. Andy opened the door and looks at the pool table. Before he got there, she brushes all this cocaine on his pool table as if he's not going to see it. Andy comes in and looks at the pool table and starts shouting at his houseboy because he thought this was chalk dust. He gets out his little broom and starts brushing. How much would that be? I have no idea. In that day, in the 70s, that was, a, that was Hollywood money. And he apologized profusely as her nostrils got very, very big. And she wanted to get the next plane back to Hollywood. I mentioned earlier, uh, I've been honored in my career to have 25, 30 gold records. Uh, this is not a gold record, but this is called a pre-release. And I have a few of these, and I, I show this one to you because it's very special. Uh, this is the Eagles. Uh, this was the first uh, session for Joe Walsh with the Eagles. This was the last one for Don Pilder. Uh, this was Hotel California. The only way you know this is Hotel California is because it's there and designated uh, title, whatever you call that. Uh, that's a uh, that's a prize. That's a prize piece. We keep it in a vault up in the North Georgia Mountains. This one I bring up because of my old buddy Cooter Waller. Cooter, do you have any idea what the story is? This is Roger Maris, and I decided to include this slide today because you know, for you sports fans, you know what's going on with Aaron Judge, who is about to break Roger's home run, home run record. Roger was my neighbor uh, the last year of his life. Cooter had two Mickey Mantles baseball cards. I'm sorry. I had two Mickey Mantle baseball cards. No Roger Maris. He had a Roger Maris. So I gave him Mickey Mantle for a Roger Maris. <laughs> you sent my daughter through college. <laughs> Somebody asked me once, so you got a bunch of autographs of uh, Roger Maris? You don't ask your neighbor for an autograph. You don't, you don't do that. Except this time. I got his autograph at a different event, a place called the Thistle Do. He was appearing for the grand opening. And then I was able to get his autograph because he was my neighbor. After he passed away, his wife, Pat, called me over one day and said, I know you were a big fan, but I don't know if you ever held any of his baseball bats. And I said, no. And she said, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. 
So in the den of their home was a bat rack. And in the bat rack were Roger's favorite bats that he did not give to the Hall of Fame. And it was a thrill to hold the bat of the great Roger Maris. He was a very nice man. Imagination comes a time when you want to contribute in some way to the amelioration of mankind. You learn those things. My young wife was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 29. And I said, what do you want to do? Uh, part one of that story is in the Beacon this week, and part two is next week. What do you want to do? And she said, I want to tour the country, and I want to meet with uh, researchers and doctors who are on the cutting edge of this, because I want to, to be able to somewhat be a megaphone for young women who are afflicted with this disease, because so many diagnoses are missed because the breast at that age is dense, and sometimes in a routine examination, it's not picked up. Sometimes even a mammogram doesn't pick it up. Uh, hers was picked up by an MRI. And uh, so we toured the country. We left in Key West on Memorial Day weekend, went all the way up to Maine, over into Canada, down to Nova Scotia, went across country, so on and so forth. We were out there for almost a year and it was uh, quite, a, quite a learning experience. Uh, she, would, uh, she would make an appearance on television and get a phone call from somebody who was motivated by her presentation. And we'd get in the car and drive out to a trailer park or wherever the person was. And I know of at least two occasions where she was the last voice that these women heard as they were passing away. Uh, so, wakeamerica.com. FedEx arrived every morning to pick up the tape that we 